This is a lunar lander. The sole purpose of this task is to land the vehicle on the surface of the moon. As trivial as this task might seem to a human being, it turns out that it is dauntingly difficult to train bots which can solve this problem with no prior knowledge of this game. Just imagine, you are required to build a bot but not allowed to feed any information to the bot from outside. The bot has to learn to solve this problem by interacting with the game itself. We call these kinds of learning paradigms reinforcement learning. Welcome to this reinforcement learning series. I am your host Raj Tilakpal and in this series I will be introducing you to yet another subfield of AI which has the potential to change every corner of our life. Welcome to Campus X. Subscribe to keep following this series. Sit back, enjoy and learn. So, how do we create bots that learn to solve a problem by themselves? Perhaps turning to how we learn to solve a problem might give us an idea. When we learn to play a game, we spontaneously interact with the controls of the game. After numerous failed attempts, when we finally win for the first time, the feelings of joy runs through our veins. This feeling of joy and satisfaction is due to the release of a chemical in our brain called dopamine. The more we win, the more we receive this reward signal that our brain produces. Slowly, we learn to optimize our pathway to the winning move through the numerous experiences we gain by playing this game again and again. To apply the same fundamentals in these self-learning bots, we release the bot in the environment. We don't give it any knowledge of the environment. It starts with behaving completely randomly. If the bot satisfies the goal, we give it rewards, much the same as dopamine release. The bot not only tries to maximize these rewards, but also optimizes its pathway to the ultimate goal. Since this approach is so fundamental to our own learning system, it becomes evident that we develop the mathematics correctly, these methods ought to work. And they do. Before moving on further, let's talk why RL is increasing its popularity and what are the recent advancements in this field. Dating its existence back to the 1950s, RL algorithms were created based on the probabilistic models and tabular approaches. Until in 1992, an RL agent almost defeated the world champion in the game of backgammon. This was the first time neural networks were integrated into reinforcement learning. In 2013, deep learning methods made it possible to successfully integrate neural networks into reinforcement learning seamlessly. DeepMind, a company owned by Google, came up with its DQN algorithm which outplayed every algorithm in existence in several Atari 2600 games. In 2016, DeepMind's AlphaGo system beat the world champion Lee Sedol in the game of Go. After that, RL took off like a rocket. Companies started investing heavily in this field and every day new problems were being tackled. From managing cooling systems in Google's data centers, understanding protein folding, to autonomous vehicles, autonomous traffic control systems, robotics in industrial automation, there is nothing to which RL cannot be applied to. RL's contribution in the healthcare system will take up a dedicated video to explain. Optimizing and understanding chemical reactions to targeted advertisement and marketing, RL is everywhere. RL can even tackle generative modeling which GANs handle at the moment. Researchers say RL can make it even better. Alright, enough boasting. Let's find out how we implement these systems in practice. There is an environment and an agent. The agent is the learner and decision maker. The agent interacts with the environment by taking actions on it. The environment in return gives back the agent an observation and a reward. The reward is just a single number. The cycle starts with the agent pulling an observation from the environment. The agent processes the observation and takes an action in the environment. The environment then presents the agent with a reward for its previous action and another observation. The agent again processes the observation and takes an action. This cycle continues over and over again. If this cycle stops at a particular point, we call them 
episodic tasks for example board games if you win the game is over if the cycle goes on forever we call them continuing tasks for example controlling an oil refinery the agent's goal is to collect as much rewards as possible by taking optimal actions the behavior of an agent in an environment is termed as its policy policy is just a function which takes an observation and spits out the action therefore policy is what determines the agent's behavior in a system the sole purpose of the agent is to maximize the total amount of rewards that can be obtained from the environment the total amount of rewards is termed as the return and is typically written with a g the return is calculated for every step for example the return for step 3 is the total rewards accumulated from step 3 and onwards the return is typically written with a gamma which is called the discount factor don't think too much about it as we'll talk about this factor a lot when we implement the algorithms in practice in short the discount factor hinders the ability of the agent to look too far into the future when you play chess you can look 3 4 steps into the future and understand how good or bad playing a move at this point is that's the same idea applied here we are limiting the agent's ability to look too far into the future an obvious question arises here Of course it makes sense to take actions which give us the maximum return but how does the agent know what the actual return for a particular observation will be it has not taken those actions yet that's it the agent does not know the actual returns and it has to learn what the return will be so that it can behave optimally it has to estimate the return it does so by exploring the environment taking exploratory moves on the environment and learning what the rewards will be when an agent sees an observation it tries to estimate the return that can be gained this estimate is known as value value is another simple function which takes in an observation and spits out the estimated returns that the agent thinks that it will get i know there are too many things to process here let's take an example to make the understanding concrete Let's say the agent just pulled an observation OT. There are a number of actions it can take and those actions can lead to different observations. The policy determines what actions are the most promising. In this case, the func- policy function tells us that the actions A1 and A3 are the most suitable. The agent then uses the value function to estimate the expected returns for each of these leading observations. In this case since observation O3T+1 has the maximum value the agent takes action A3 and receives a reward of RT+1 which is 1 the agent then follows the same rule to continue till the last step Once it has all the rewards it can now accurately calculate the return for every observation every time it finds the value to be a little off than the actual return the agent updates the value function accordingly the agent continues to sample trajectories and keeps learning the values and the policy this is the fundamental principle of reinforcement learning all right let's jump in deeper into all of these elements When I said that the policy and value functions take the current observation as input, I was a little wrong. It does not take an observation as input, it takes in a state as input. Now what is a state? Understand that the environment has an internal state according to which it functions. Every time an action is taken, the internal state modifies and therefore produces a different observation. It is not necessary that only the actions taken by the agent modifies the state it can be some other external factor that changes it the point is the internal state of the environment is not visible to the agent the agent has to make out the state from the observation itself in all of our previous examples the agent tries to estimate the state of the environment from the observations it received and keeps track of only these states Therefore whatever examples we cover from now on we are going to use the state instead of the original observation 
Now partly true is the fact that the state of the environment is completely hidden from the agent. Environments where the agent can make out the exact state from the observation itself are called fully observable environments. For example, typical board games like chess where the agent can make out the entire state just by looking at the board and the positions of its pieces. Environments where the agent cannot completely make out the state of the environment from the observation are called partially observable environments. Examples are typical real world problems like driving a car where the agent can only make out what its cameras can see and nothing beyond it. The reward signal defines the goal of a reinforcement learning problem. This signal defines what are the good and bad events for the agent. The rewards can be positive or negative based on whether the agent is taking the right actions or diverting from them. As an analogy, compare the positive rewards to dopamine release and compare the negative rewards to the pain incurred when you fall off a bicycle because of your mistake. As mentioned earlier, a policy defines the agent's behavior at a given time. The policy is just a simple mapping from perceived states to actions to be taken on those states. It is typically written with a pi and can either be deterministic or stochastic. In deterministic policies, the policy function throws out a concrete action that has to be taken whereas a stochastic policy returns a probability distribution of the action space. For example, let's say there are four actions in a problem. Deterministic policy will take in a state and return an action to be taken whereas a stochastic policy will return the probability of all the actions in the problem. The value function estimates the returns that can be gained by following a specific policy. Understand that the rewards indicate what is good for the agent in an immediate sense whereas the value function specifies what is good in the long run. The equation of the value function is given as the expected return at a particular state and following policy pi. This can also be written by expanding the return but the main question is why is there an expectation in the equation? Why can the value not be equal to the return? Well, when an agent is about to take an action, if the environment is deterministic, which means that if you are sure that taking action A on state ST will lead to state ST plus 1, then there is no problem in making the value function equal to the return. But if the environment is stochastic, which means that taking action A on state S can lead to a number of states, then the returns for all of these states have to be considered. And since we consider the probabilities of the agent falling in these states, it makes sense to apply an expectation in the value function. An example might help here. Consider a grid world where the agent randomly starts at a point and has to reach a goal. When the agent takes up action, the agent moves one cell upwards. This environment is deterministic. Now let's say we introduce wind in this grid world. The wind will blow from left to right. Now taking action up can lead to either this cell or this or these based on the speed of the wind. This is a stochastic environment where the agent is not sure if taking action up will lead to what specific cell. Therefore it estimates the expected return for all of these possible next states. Finally, let us summarize the formal components of a reinforcement learning problem. First of all, there is an environment which works with the dynamics. Given a state and action, it returns the next state. There is a reward function which takes in a state and returns the reward for reaching that state. There is a policy which takes in a state and returns an action. There is a value function which takes in a state and gives out the expected return. And lastly, there is a model which we did not talk about to keep things simple for beginners. That's all the components in a reinforcement learning system. If you are still here after going through all of these, congratulations, you now know the basics of reinforcement learning and the primary elements used in this field. I know you might have a lot of questions in your head. Some of them might be, okay, you said that the policy and value are functions, but what are these functions made up of? How do these functions learn? and what kind of learning algorithms do people use? These questions are exactly what we'll tackle in the subsequent videos. So stick out for the next one and see you there.